Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? Hope y'all doing well, cause I'm, I'm wonderful. Just living the dream. I quit drinking. That's the topic of today's video. So I wanna just say thanks up front. Thanks for joining me on this talk. The scenery's not gonna change. Might as well call it a podcast, but I'm gonna talk about why I made the decision to quit drinking. And as far as I'm concerned, this is not a check ride. So I got a bunch of notes here. I'll try to stay on track, but I don't know if this video is gonna be an hour, two hours, three hours. So just bear with me, because that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, again, when I talk about going on a check ride, y'all heard me many times before talk about if you're a hard drinker or even middle of the road drinker, what I've done my entire life is every now and then I go on what's called a check ride. That means you quit right then, cold turkey, stop for various reasons. The main thing, number one, is to make sure you're in control and not the booze. Because if you can't just say, okay, I quit right now for two weeks, one month, two months, and stick to that, then you're not in control. So my check rides in the past have lasted anywhere from a week to two weeks to a month. You know, a couple years ago, I went six months. I just decided, boom, check ride. I made it six months. And then, you know, went back to drinking. Why? Because I like the taste of beer. I like the taste of Jack Daniels whiskey. I love the taste of red wine. And I'm not gonna apologize for that. And let me make this clear up front. This isn't an apology, pour my heart out type of video. Um, the reason I'm doing this video is just to share my thoughts to share uh, what my plan is going forward and to invoke thought in you, the viewer, especially if you're a drinker. And I'm not judging anybody. My gosh, I'm the last person who, who wants to judge anybody for drinking, doing what they want to do. It's, it's your life. You're the captain of your own destiny, just as I'm the captain of my own destiny. So this isn't, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm a born again, whatever, born again, born again Christian and trying to tell you to stop drinking or nothing like that. I'm not a holy roller trying to preach to you. Again, I'm just invoking thought, sharing my stories. So if you drink, hey, there's a high percentage, percentage of y'all that are part of my channel, part of my show, because you do drink. What's the tagline on, on my show? Food, beer, and visas. So it's kind of crazy that I'm cutting out the beer. It's taking one third of my tagline. I may lose one third of my viewers because I don't drink anymore. But I've said from the beginning, this show, there is no niche. This show is about my life, living on the overstay road, so to speak. And I just say and I do whatever I want to do. You know, one day I'm doing a cooking video. Next minute, I'm talking about why I quit drinking. It's my show. I get to do whatever I want. So if I lose some of you because of the, I'm not drinking anymore, it is what it is. I'm 51 now. You know, for the longest time, I said I'm a pirate looking at 50. I don't even know how many years before I started saying that. But like 50 was a big milestone. I guess it's a scary milestone in anybody's life because 100 for me is like the magic number. That's like the maximum amount of years we have on this earth. Now I've extended it seven years and I truly believe that I'm going to live to be 107 years old. That's my goal. But I think the average person would agree with me that 100 is like the maximum for most human beings. And most of us ain't gonna get to 100. But you use 100, is that, that's like the goal. If I can make a 100 Christmases, 
That's all you get, at least with today's medicine and technology. So here I am, 51, and of course my thoughts have changed over the years. And what my thoughts are now obviously conflict with what I've said on probably a thousand previous videos. I don't, I don't even know how many videos I've got posted on this platform now. I think it's 1,700, 1,800, I don't even know. But inevitably, if you want to comb back through that, my advice and my philosophy is going to conflict with everything I say in this video. I'm sure it is, but hey, as we age, we get more experience, our bodies start to break down, we start to slow down. All right, let's all agree that that things change. Time changes things. I'm not making this decision. Okay, was this decision sparked uh, by a bender, by a thunder run, by about a three day, you know, a three day drunk tied one on? Just, well, yes and no. Because here's what usually happens. What usually happens when you suffer from a bad hangover, which I just went through a few days ago, you make the decision then, I'm never drinking again. Well, really, you're making that decision because you're in pain, right? And <laughs> you make that decision. And a lot of times I've decided to go on check rides, have been because I was in the middle of a hangover and said, I can't, I, I, gotta, I gotta throttle it back. I gotta make sure I'm in, in control. I feel like hell and you have like two ways to go during that that time frame of being in a hangover you typically at least what I typically do what Pablo would do the next day you bite the dog or they call it bite the hair of the dog. Anyhow, Pablo used to say time to bite the dog and everybody has a different remedy for getting over a hangover, but for me, it was like a bottle of Gatorade, shot of Jack Daniels, two beers. If I hit, if I hit that, I feel great. I'm like, hey, you wanna go get some lunch? Go to the library? It don't matter. But that little cocktail will cure a hangover. Anyhow, so a lot of these decisions to go and check rides have been made because uh, just felt like hell tore up the town, left some tattoos on the town as they speak, feeling like hell, and it was time to dry, dry out and slow down, regain control, make ensure that I'm in control. Then eventually, obviously, I've always went back to drinking. I'm not making this decision during or because of a hangover. I'm stone cold sober right now. And I'm making the decision, <laughs> I'm making the decision right now, just underneath this beautiful blue sky, sitting out here, I got a breeze coming through, looking at palm trees, my kids, everybody's running around. I'm making the, the decision in a, in a good frame of mind. Now, was I thinking about this while I was laying there staring at the, the ceiling for a couple days trying to trying to recover from a hangover? Well, yeah, but this isn't a knee-jerk reaction, all right? So I'm gonna go through, like I said, I've got four pages. Make it five. I got five pages, some articles. This video might be four or five hours long. Did I mention that? What about some of the effects? Some of the effects that I see in my life. Let me caveat this by saying, in my adult life, I've never attended an AA meeting. I don't have time for that. I don't need that. I know all about AA, but because of another reason. So, back to when I was a kid, I had an uncle who was a recovering alcoholic. And he'd been sober. I, I mean, I never knew the man. He married my aunt. I never knew the man uh, while he was drinking. Because when he married my aunt, the guy had been sober for like, I don't know, 10 years. But he was a big part of AA, uh, helping to facilitate the local program. You know, he sponsored people. 
went to all the meetings, all the conferences and stuff. He was giving back to what helped him get sober and stay sober. So I don't want to say he was a big wig, but really he was. He was like upper echelon of the local uh, AA infrastructure there. So I would spend a lot of time in the summer with my, my aunt and ended up, you know, just going along for the ride to these things. And in a way, it's sort of like a church, you know, the adults, adults are in there having their meeting and then they have uh, meetings for the kids, the, uh, the teens. And so I was part of that, but only because he was a part of it 10 years after, you know, his ride with riding the booze and partying and all that stuff. So I understand AA, I get it. I've been to a lot of functions as a child in that capacity. Didn't understand what the other kids were going through having an alcoholic for a parent, but I sat in there and learned a lot. With all that said, I don't agree, uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't accept the label of alcoholic. You don't get to form an organization and then brand something and everybody else has to succumb to it. I, I reject that. So people say, oh, you're an alcoholic. Well, you can say what you want, but that's one organization's branding. And, and so I, I don't consider myself that. I respect what they do. They've helped a lot of people. Maybe they've, maybe they've helped you, but I don't need that. I don't need to go to a group meeting to say, I'm gonna quit drinking alcohol. Luckily, I should knock on wood, right? That I'm not that type of, uh, I don't have that type of personality. Anyhow, moving forward. Uh, with, with all that said, I'm just gonna give you my, my thoughts and theories on what booze does to you, right? Well, one thing it does for me, and I started to bring her on, her on here and have her talk about it, the old lady. We've been together six, seven years, right? I think I piss her off on a daily basis. And a lot of it is brought on by what? By drinking. Most of us, including myself, I'm the nicest person in the world until what? Until you start adding alcohol and then you get an instant asshole. A couple of beers, two, three beers, I'm running for mayor. I start talking, I come out of this introverted shell that I I mean, I'm an introverted asshole by nature. Get, me, get a few beers in me, I'm running for mayor. A couple more, I'm running for president. Add one more, instant asshole. And so I think on a daily basis over six to seven years, except when I went on these check rides, again, one was for six months, nobody noticed. Anyhow, we'll barbecue at night, we'll drink. Everybody has a good meal, what have you. And then two, three beers send me over the edge. Next thing you know, old lady's pissed off bigger than shit. Something stupid I said. So I, I just made a note on that. I said, what do I do? I'll piss off my old lady on a daily basis, right? Um, it helps you piss off your friends and your family. And I could sit there and talk for, we could talk for hours about what that entails, but just leave it at that, right? You're gonna piss off your wife, your friends, your family. I recently made a video talking about this American that got shot. And it doesn't matter the circumstances. What was, what was there involved? When you involve a bar, drinking late at night nothing good ever happens in a bar in the words of that brother on uh, the Ye on Yellowstone that day worker said nothing ever good happens in a bar that's true to a certain extent and what what's the factor in a bar it's alcohol you get to the underlying cause root cause of everybody's problems it comes back to alcohol. I just did a quick scan on the news. You know, 
some dude over in Patty was drunk, couldn't get his gate open, so he tried to go over the top ropes with the, you know, over here we have pointy, kill you burglar bars, right? Over here they're medieval. What'd he do? He's drunk, can't get his key to work, or can't get the gate open, tries to go over the top ropes, impales his ass on his own burglar bars. They get there, they get him off the burglar bars, and from what I heard, he died later, later that night. What was the underlying root cause? Well, if you go back, it was him being the captain of his own destiny, not blaming alcohol. Nobody forces you to put a beer to your mouth or hit a shot at vodka. Nobody forces you to do that. I'm not saying that. He was the captain of his own destiny. That's the root cause. But the contributing factor, number one contributing factor, was alcohol. Now, he's dead. So many people locked up and in jail for anything from drunk driving and, you know, killing somebody to you name it. Again, they're the captain of their own destiny, but the alcohol was the number one contributing factor, right? So anyhow, what I was thinking when I was laying, laying there with, suffering from this big ass hangover, I said, dude, you despise hypocrisy. But you sat there and made a video about a dude getting shot in a bar early morning. Obviously, somewhere there's booze involved with somebody. And now you just went on a two-day bender laying up, laying up here like you didn't learn any lesson. You didn't take any lessons from yourself when you talked about that video. Here you are, 51 years old, pulling the same shit a week later. And luckily, by the grace of God, you know, you're just suffering from a hangover. And you're not in, the, in a coffin or the morgue or the hospital. You name it. I said, that's pure hypocrisy. And I felt disappointed in myself. Booze causes you to waste a lot of money. A lot of money. In so many various ways. Number one, it ain't free. Now I'm going to talk about both sides of how drinking has contributed to a lot of happiness in my life today. But also how, how it wastes money. All right, it, it's expensive, right? So you, you take a night out on the town, anywhere you're at in the world, it's easy to spend 150 to 300 bucks by one night out on the town. Hell, that's like... Well, it used to be half a car payment. <laughs> Maybe it's now like a quarter of a car payment in America, but you're talking burning some Benjamins just one night out on the town. What if you drink, uh, you know, a six pack a day? Add that, uh, multiply that times 30. All of a sudden you're drinking your light bill. It's not cheap. It takes money away from your pocket. There's no doubt. Let me break it down on a simplistic level since I'm here in the Philippines. Her father likes to drink kalafu. Now kalafu is this, what is it, like cheap Chinese wine? I forget how they bill it. It's worse than kerosene. I'd rather drink a kerosene and Coke than drink kalafu. For me, it's absolutely horrible, but it's very popular here in the Philippines. Uh, among, you know, I, I don't want to generalize and stereotype and say all the poor people drink it, but in my travels, you know, people way out in the province and the village, they got the little to no money. That's where Kalafu is popular. But the thing about Kalafu, it's like, what is it, 50 pesos? Let's say roughly a dollar a bottle. You know, how, you know what that equates to? That equates to a kilo of rice. A kilo of rice can feed a small family for a day, you know, give or take, whatever. But every bottle that you see me buy her father is a day's worth of food. You know, a lot of people here, I mean, look, rice is the food and then whatever you flavor it with, whatever you can come up with, can of sardines, small piece of chicken, you make do. So you see all these people that, you know, appear to be dirt poor and appear not to have anything. But if you look around the village or 
you know, around wherever they're living, there's a pile of Kalafu bottles or a pile of Red Horse bottles. Every one of those bottles equates to a kilo of rice. You know, 50 pesos a kilo, that's like 2.2 pounds. So two pounds of rice for every bottle you see laying around. And people act like they don't have enough food, but, and I'm not picking on people here in the Philippines. Rednecks are the same way. They're broke, can't pay their light bill, but they always got what? Beer and cigarettes. Yeah, it's a messed up priority, which I'm guilty of as well. The point is, you know, drinking, booze, it costs money. So, with that said, what if there was no alcohol in my life ever? I would not have taken a lot of the risks that I have taken or have went on certain adventures or pursued job opportunities. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I'm at. So what has it gotten me? It's gotten me so many adventures. I ended up writing two books because once I started drinking rum, the words just came to me. You know, a brain to fingers typing away on a keyboard for hours at a time. I wrote two books. I've got other books that are started that at some point, at, at some point I'll finish them. So even though, even though rum helped me write two books, the same drinking has prevented me from writing the third, the fourth, the fifth, because I just don't have the energy. Does that make sense? There's like yin and yang, good and evil to it. Anyhow. So I got, I got two books credit to my name, thanks to drinking cheap rum over in Thailand. What else wouldn't I have? And what you might not have either, or probably 80% of the world's population wouldn't be here. If you go back in your relationship, there was probably booze involved. Take your wife, you know, your soon-to-be wife out to dinner. Y'all have too much wine. Next thing you know, you ended up at the Holiday Inn. Next thing you know, you're getting married because, you know, she missed her period. Kids. Come on, folks. Kids. I got two wonderful children right here running around. I got more kids around the world. Why? Because I was out partying, chasing women, drinking beer, dancing until the wee, wee hours of the morning. and End up shacking up with their mothers and, boom, brought them into this world. If I was stone cold sober and going to bed at nine o'clock, I probably wouldn't have any kids. Maybe I would, maybe I'd have, you know, 1.5 kids and I'd be mowing my grass now in suburbia. But you see the, the good and the evil, the yin and yang. You know, if you're sitting there gonna invest in something or buy something that you need for your business or what have you, and a lot of us just suffer from analysis paralysis. We just can't pull that trigger. And you just don't do anything. You don't take any action. Well, what happens when I go in there and drink a couple beers? Click, click, click. That shit's purchased on the way. Let's roll the dice. You gotta break some eggs and make an omelet, right? So money, money's a big part. A big part of drinking. It's cost me a lot of money throughout the years. But I have had some return on investment <laughs> due to some of the decisions I've made. But I've lost a lot of money, admittedly. So we could talk about that all day long, but. Oh, another thing I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have this YouTube channel. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if it weren't for my drinking and partying and, and my crazy antics because I'm an introverted person. It's, it's very difficult for me. Well, it's not now. It's not now, it's second nature. But when you try to start talking to a camera and you're not good at it, or you're not naturally good at it, in the beginning, it's difficult to sit here and have a conversation with y'all because I'm really talking to this lens. 
you know, trying to ignore everybody else, I'm trying to make sure the audio's. It, it's a, uh, it's a process. Hit a few beers, you just hit the record and start talking. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if I had not, uh, hey buddy, hey man, you doing okay? You wanna sit by Papa? The boy slept in late. If, if it weren't for my drinking and my partying and my antics, I wouldn't have this YouTube channel. I wouldn't have 50, what am I coming up on? 55,000 of y'all out there watching our show? My gosh. Me Dios, gracias por su hospitalidad. But it wouldn't have been made possible without me drinking beer. And, and I think I'm going to go through an article. It's a, it's a long article, but a lot of points. I'm going to read it verbatim. But a couple of things happened where I started getting some traction on this channel. I was in my pool one day and I said, I was in the pool one day and I said, I'm putting out these videos. I don't know how many I had at that time. I'm putting out these videos, nobody's watching. Very small following at that time. I said, what am I doing wrong? I'm just pouring my heart out into putting this stuff together, right? Struggling th through the editing process, the filming, because I don't know anything about this stuff. I know, I know a little bit about the filming, but the editing was just like, my gosh, this is rocket science. But I made the decision to not give up trying to keep this curse word free. I made the decision, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to say what I want to do. If I don't make any money, I lose all my subscribers, uh, I get banned from YouTube. I don't care because what I'm doing is not working. I'm just wasting my time. It's a hobby that the only people who are watching these videos are me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so when I made the decision that the gloves came off, all of a sudden I started getting viewers. I started getting subscribers. I started getting traction. Because the only thing that differentiates me walking down a beach and doing a video versus you walking down the same beach and doing the video well it's the talent it's the it's the narration it's the dialogue so if i'm just sitting there pushing out conde nice you know squeaky clean shows content whatever you want to call it nobody wants to see that why wouldn't they just go watch conde nice it's professionally and i'm just using that just go watch any professionally produced travel show right but anyhow, when I decided not to give up, that's when, that's when things started working for me. So, anyhow, back to the problems. What should we start with first? Mental health or physical health? Uh, let's go with uh, physical health. For me, it causes me to gain weight. Before the lockdown, I was 140 pounds in, in tip-top fighting shape. But I'd made a deal with myself while I was going to Muay Thai that I, I, could, I, I couldn't drink unless I went to the gym that day, you know, went to Muay Thai. So I would go to Muay Thai, come home, i just drink me two or three Heinekens, and I was so exhausted and, so, and hurting so bad, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't go to the bar because I basically got, was getting in a fight every day, right, so to speak. Not that I was getting hit that hard, but the workout was what was killing me. So I would go hit that Muay Thai, do my run, come back, drink me. I would literally drink beer while I'm in the shower, just trying to recover. And when I come out of that shower, I was exhausted. I mean, I had enough energy to make love to my girlfriend and then watch TV. I didn't have time to go to the bar and do any binge drinking or crazy partying, any stuff like that. So it was all positive. But when, you, when I don't do that, because I started spending time in the Philippines and then we went through the lockdown, I've just put on weight. I weighed myself the other day, and ashamed to admit, but it is what it is. I'm ashamed, but I'm not. I'm ashamed, I'm disappointed in myself. I'm 180 pounds. That's only six pounds under my fat ass 
when I moved to Thailand, I was 186 pounds years ago. But I went from 140, now I'm at 180. My gosh, and a lot of it is because I've been sitting around drinking. Luckily, beer, whiskey, whiskey, and women have been my only vices as far as physical health, physical addiction, right? Just to throw that out there. But you know, after this last bender, like my kidneys were hurting. When I stopped drinking, I'm like, God damn, my kidneys are hurting. What the hell's going on here? That's something I haven't really experienced. But I was hurting. I was hurting after this last drinking. Ain't gonna lie. But physical health, big weight gain for me. Out of shape. In action. And one of the main things... Okay, well, I'll save this for last, but... Also, like when, when I'm drinking, it takes me longer to edit videos. So it's a, it's a reduction in performance. You're slow to perform many tasks while you're drinking or the next day when uh, you're nursing a hangover, right? When I'm stone cold sober, I can set that camera up so much quickly. I can edit so much quickly. Yesterday, I did so much work before noon I mean, it was like, it would have took me two days, two, three days to do that, you know, a few weeks ago. So what alcohol does, well, i just factor this in. It robs you of time. Hours just disappear from the day. It makes the day go by faster because the alcohol is just taking away chunks of time. And then when you have a hangover, days are wasted because you're just laying there, you can't function. Can't do, can't do al algebra. Certainly can't do algebra. Hell, this last hangover, I couldn't operate a damn cast iron skillet. Somebody turned the flame on for me. So a time is a big thing that it robs you of. Now, if you want a true motivator, and again, I'm not trying to influence anybody. I'm just trying to invoke thought. So I'm not casting stones. Not telling you what to do. What I've learned is grown men don't want to be told what to do. You can talk to them till you're blue in the face trying to tell them what they should do. They will not fucking listen. If you just present the material in a way to where it invokes thought, if, they th if, if you think about one thing after this video, I win. I have won. When I've ever, ever been in an instructor type position, in my life, which I have in various capacities, believe it or not. I'm a pretty good instructor when, when I'm not drinking. I realized that if my students, whatever the topic was, could walk out of that classroom and be arguing or talking or discuss it over lunch, hell, if they were arguing about something, wonderful. I got the gold medal. If they discussed one thing at lunch, you know, a couple hours later or that night, I got the silver. If they mention something, hey, I, I win. If they walk out of your classroom and never discuss any of that shit again, you lost them. You, you're, you were just a talking head putting people to sleep. And so my objective was and is, is just to make you think after the fact and I win. But think about this, sexual performance. If you're 18 years old, I'm not talking to you. I mean... When I was 18, uh, come on, I could party all night, bang out a chick from two to six, get up, you know, brush my teeth, go to work for two days. Okay, I'm not talking to you. But if you're a guy around my age, around 50, and you drink, especially if you drink too much, or especially if you drink too much in one night and meet up with a young lady, you know, you can find yourself trying to shoot pool with a goddamn rope. You know, my one buddy, he died, uh, this is decades ago, but he, he died from basically what? From drinking too much. But the night that I knew he had a problem, we were at this bar, and there was a couple of pool tables, and we're shooting pool, we're trying to talk to these girls. What, that's what we always did. And all of a sudden, he was like holding on to the pool table, like bouncing a little bit, like, like a little bit of bounce. 
and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? First, I thought he was dancing to the beat. But this older cat who looked at him and knew exactly what it was, he's like, man, you're so fucking drunk. He said, you need to go home and get some sleep. He said, go home, get, go, go back to the room, get some sleep, man. You can't shoot pool with a rope. And that's the first time I realized my, my buddy had a problem. But that was his statement. You need to go back, get some sleep, man. You can't shoot pool with a rope. Now, my first thought was, we're talking about the pool game. Then I, oh, yeah, I get it. Well, exactly. So too much, bull, too much booze. You're rocking a wet noodle in your pants. You're not going to do any damage. Unless you want to pull an elf. <laughs> it'll got the flaco. And go to plan B. But I'm telling you this. In my experience, right? If I'm drinking... I can muster up the perform, I don't want to say muster, I can perform once a day and not get any, uh, nobody say anything. I can mask that the booze is affecting me. But if I'm stone cold sober, folks, it's like two times a day with a goddamn jackhammer is nothing. And I don't take Viagra, I don't take none of that shit. If I'm sober at 51, I could be a porn star right now and perform any time you want me to. Dirk Diggler ain't got shit on me. Well, he might have that, but he ain't got the frequency, the time, the stamina if I'm stone cold sober. When I'm drinking, I can't keep up with Dirk Diggler, admittedly. So what I'm going to submit to you, the viewer, is that if, you, if you're around my age or, or if you're anybody who has to take Viagra, and you're a drinker, the drinking is the problem. I'm going to argue that the reason you have to take Viagra is because you drink. If you take away the booze, there's a good chance you won't need Viagra. That's in my personal opinion. And again, I'm just trying to invoke thought. So if you're, you're sitting there, oh shit, I'm out of Viagra while you're popping a fucking beer, or hitting a vodka, think about that. You want to shoot pool with a rope one time a day if you're lucky? Or you want to be a damn jackhammer without pills? That's my personal experience. Trust me, I'm not saying I don't need Viagra, knock on wood. I can still drink all day. Maybe not on a long bender, but if I drink normally, I'm still good one time a day. The Stone Cold Sober? Folks, I've only been back a couple days where already broke the goddamn office chair in there. I had, to, I had to steal one of the living room chairs to go in my office for, you know, for Tenderoni time with the old lady because we broke my damn office chair already. That's a good thing. All right, so once I quit drinking, well, when, when I went on that six-month check ride, I wasn't doing anything special about working out. The only workout I was doing was doubling, doubling time in the sack with the old lady. But after six months, she made the mention. She said, oh my, she's got, my God, your tummy's going down. Now she's with me every day. So she's with me every day and still noticed that I was losing my belly naturally. Naturally, number one, but number two, I guess the increase in sexual activity. I was losing my stomach. So getting back, going back down to be flat again. All right, let's move on to the the mental health aspect, right? When when you drink, or when I drink, it's like you're constantly on an emotional roller coaster of highs and lows, peaks and valleys. Problems aren't dealt with, or lessened, or forgotten. For me, they're actually amplified. They're intensified. A small problem will, will cause me to have the, I'll have the perception that a small problem is the end of the world. You know, like when you break up with your first love and you're just devastated. When, it, when the small problem actually might just be a phone call or, uh, you know, a couple emails or a call to customer service. But when I'm drinking, that problem is such a mountain, I don't want to address it. So you procrastinate about 
taking care of small problems. It was like my buddy Pablo when he was going through his divorce. May you rest in peace, my friend. Small things like, like responding to his attorney in a timely fashion. Couldn't pull it off. No, you get drunk, call up his wife's attorney and cuss the bitch out. Just giving her ammunition. He call up his own attorney. What do they do? They bill him for the hour on the phone. They let him talk. Hey, he's the client. Listen to this drunk talk. Another 350 bucks out of his pocket. Where, as if he was stone cold sober, he would have sent an email. They're not going to charge you. I mean, come on. An email is not 350 an hour, right? I mean, obviously they're charging you, but you see my point. He didn't address the small problems. It became a big problem that affected him till the day he died. All because the, the inaction caused by him drinking vodka. Depression, feeling like shit. Uh, you know, all these clinical terms like depression, right? What is depression? I don't know. I think it's like a combination of feeling like shit, physical, physically and emotionally. In other words, you're suffering from a hangover, or you're just suffering from the daily effects of drinking. Then you have a problem that comes up, whatever. You don't want to deal with it, and then people say you're depressed. Either way. Now we're on a lake. Like I said on a recent Handsome Donkey Award. Big Frank the Tank, who comes over and leaves me nasty messages, trying to hurt my feelings, talking about my children. The reason that guy is so miserable, because he's so fat, he feels bad. 24-7, 365 days a year. Fat people, you can't escape the fat. They can't escape it that right then, immediately. They feel so bad that they lash out and want to hurt others. And like I told you, Big Frank the Tank, if you lose that weight, you will feel so much better. You won't have time to go to other people's YouTube channels and leave nasty comments trying to hurt their feelings. So it's the same with the booze. You don't feel as good. When I'm stone cold sober and have been, I feel great. I feel absolutely wonderful. You don't have those highs and those lows. Matter of fact, one of the things that I was able to do during that six month check ride, which was really crazy, is I got to the point towards like month, month number five, and this was almost a motivator for me to quit then, I got to the point where I could control my dreams. I usually, I, I don't know about you, I'm not in control of my dreams. Whatever they are, they are, right? It's just abstract. But I was to the point where I was starting to control my dreams. What I wanted to dream about, which direction I wanted to go in the dream. It was like, I don't know, it was crazy. And then when I went back to drinking, all that shit went out the window again. I lost control of my dreams. Just something interesting. Maybe I got hit by lightning, I don't know. So I think we'll all agree that physical and mental health is obviously, obviously affected by your drinking. How much you drink, you drink every day. Now there are studies, let me, let me defend red wine. There are studies that say if you drink you know, one, one glass of red wine a night, you're this much unlikely to develop heart disease, right? If you drink two glasses of red wine a night, you have a better chance of not getting it. So there's some scientists, science that says red wine is really good for you. But the problem with me is, okay, I could say, all right, let's just stick to the red wine I love red wine, I think it has some good health properties, but if I drink the red wine and all of a sudden I get tanked up, then what's the difference in picking up a beer or a shot of whiskey, right? It's a gateway, because it lets your guard down. Is alcohol a gateway to drugs? Absolutely, because it, you, let, you let your guard down. A lot of people start out with drugs, right? 
If you told them, hey, snort that line of Coke, they'd be like, oh, fuck you, man. I'm not touching that. Okay, give them six beers, two shots of tequila, and then tell them to hit that line. They don't even say nothing. They just hit it. Next thing you know, they're an addict, right? So, of course, it's a gateway. Okay, so what, what if you're, you're considering quitting, but you're really scared of the detox process? Well, for me, I've never had any problems just quitting cold turkey. Gracias, mi Dios. I have had some effects in the past, but it, it's more like maybe a headache or sweat for a couple days. So I'm going to talk about, about what I just went through the past few days, which was really nothing. And then I'm going to tell you about the time that I hallucinated about about ten about nine years ago anyhow so what I did long story ended up ended up staying at a five-star resort now you know me I like the perks I like the VIP lounge I like the free booze the free food I like to game those things with points so I end up you know pulling into the to uh, what I, I don't want to say the property I'm at a five-star resort Roll into the room. What's in the room waiting on me? Bottle of wine. Complimentary. Red wine. I just looked at it. All I did for 24 hours was the bed, the bathtub, the CR. You know, the shitter. Just back and forth. I didn't touch that wine. I didn't go to the VIP lounge and drink free beer for two hours. I didn't even get up and hit the free breakfast. It was just me drinking water and I decided to go on a two day fast. I'm big on fasting for other reasons. That's another topic, but I said, let me start this shit out with a fast. So I did a two, two and a half day, almost a third day, but the old lady cooked, cooked such good chicken and spaghetti. I, I broke it half a day early so instead of three I was gonna do three days but I broke it at 2.5 days no food only water to just shock the system and that's what worked for me did I have any effects other than my kidneys hurting <laughs> my kidneys were hurting for a couple days but no it wasn't like when I quit and I saw a burning bush in the corner of my bedroom that was about a decade ago. And I think I'm going to take a break and pause, and I'm going to pull up that article, and I'm going to read that article. Why? Because I never did a video about it. I may have talked about it, but like some of these articles that I wrote way back in the day before I was getting serious about making videos, what I want to do is go back, pull up those articles that nobody ever read, and do a video about them. And so I'm going to read that one video about the burning bush. It was back from 2015. It could be older because I shuffle around some content. So let's, let's just say it's a 10-year-old article that I wrote when I went on a check ride. Okay? So let me pull it up, and I'm going to be right back with you. One thing I left out when, when I when I hit a check ride, I just stop right then and there. Now it's very easy to soften it up if you're that type of person that can't just do it. It's easy to soften it up, but it's a fine line between biting the dog 
and just softening it up, right? So my Gatorade, a couple shots of Jack or a shot of Jack and two beers. That can soften it up, but what's to say you don't just continue on down the path, right? Anyhow. All right, so I wrote this article back in, uh, like I said, but sometime 2015 or circa 2015. Nobody read it. I've talked about it before. But it's entitled, If You Quit Drinking, Watch Out for the Burning Bush. May 1, 2015. And yeah, that's a real crocodile. I've always been a drinker. I don't apologize for that. It's my life and I'll live it the way I see fit. However, many have accused me of being an alcoholic. They blame alcoholism for my misadventures and my far from normal exploits. How else could you explain my behavior? Maybe I'm just playing crazy. I decided to get to the bottom of this mystery so I just quit right then and there, cold turkey. I figured that a two week hiatus would be sufficient enough to solve the riddle. Would I be able to pull it off? I wasn't sure what the effects would be physically. I've been partying like a rock star for around three years now. My body is used to its daily dose of the nectar of the gods. What happened? Not much initially. The second day, I got a headache that wouldn't go away. I never get headaches. The fourth night, something interesting did happen. I was awakened and immediately sat up on my bed. I gasped for air. In the corner of the darkened room was a slow burning tornado of orange flames from the floor to the ceiling, about five feet in diameter. I thought I was dreaming until I, until I said out loud, damn, I'm not dreaming. That's a fucking burning bush. Holy shit, I'm hallucinating. It was so real that I just sat there and stared at it. It didn't scare me, inspire me, or make me believe it was a message from Jesus. It was just a beautiful work of art and living color. The damn thing wouldn't go away. After about five minutes, I went to the bathroom, took a piss, and splashed some water on my face. When I got back, it was gone. I just laughed. Was it a sign? Hell yeah, it was a sign. It was a sign that said I needed a rum and coke with a lime. After about a week, the headaches went away. The second week was unremarkably boring. It seems that I'm nowhere near being an alcoholic. The funny thing was that I didn't crave alcohol like I was addicted to crack. I merely grabbed a Gatorade or some juice when I hit the convenience store and didn't really pay attention to the beer shelves. The conclusion? I like to drink, but thankfully, it doesn't rule me. I'm very much in control. I guess I'm just a bit crazy. The burning bush, pure subliminal comedy considering my stance on religion. Now again, that was 10 years ago. Different mindset at the time. I had moved to Thailand, gotten a divorce, and had spent basically three days running the streets. You know, just a daily routine. Wake up, drink a big old beer, Head out to a little sorry, sorry store where I, where I drank with my buddies who were in their mid 60s to 80. I was the youngest guy there. Me and that whole crew would then, well, me and some of the crew would go to happy hour from whatever happy hour was, five to seven. And then me and some of that crew would hit soy six. It was three years of pure carnage, mostly, most days. But it is what it is. So that's that's an article I wrote. Some people are gonna need more help than others detoxing if you're truly addicted to alcohol. I don't need that. I just, personally, I just quit. Suffer the headaches. One time I saw a burning bush. A couple days my kidneys hurt. I'm gonna be fine. But if you're the type of person that's going to hurt you, well, maybe you, need, maybe you need to check yourself into the hospital for a couple of days, you know? For me, a five-star resort, 24 hours, drying out, 
sweating like a bitch that day and the next. Again, I'm thanking God that that's all it takes for me. Okay. Got a couple pages here entitled closing. Closing and closing. So this is random thoughts here. Still talking about check rides. Again, make sure you can quit cold turkey at a moment's notice if you can. Uh, you may be addicted to women. You may be addicted to women like me, but luckily you're not addicted to the booze. Because what, what am I really addicted to my whole life is partying, which entails hanging out with your buddies, going to the bar, dancing, romancing, drinking, finding a girl, making love, right? So the drinking part was just part of the party. Now luckily, you know, me and my crew were never into drugs. Again, thank you, Medeos. Because that shit scares the hell out of me. I used to work dope and, uh, Anyhow, uh, luckily, never been into any type of drugs, not even weed. I'm just a beer drinker and whiskey drinker. Why? Because it went along with chasing women, one night stands, and that lifestyle. So I might be addicted to that, which if I'm addicted to women, guilty. I'll take that any day. But I'm not addicted to booze. So that's the purpose of a check ride, to make sure you're in control. And I'm the type of guy I never wanted the party to end. If I didn't have a girl with me to take home, I stayed till the lights came on. I never wanted the party to end. Two songs, two songs like come to mind. These are just random thoughts. Are the good times really over for good? Merle Haggard. But the true one is all my rowdy friends have settled down by Hank Williams Jr. A lot of things, I mean, well, everything, the lyrics in that song, about all my rowdy friends have settled down. It's like I'm the last guy standing. Not living, but I'm the last guy standing that still wants to continue what we were doing decades ago. There's nobody else who wants to continue. Because all my rowdy friends have settled down. A lot of my life especially rolling with my crew and in inner circle. Every time we roll out, it, it basically has been an episode of The Hangover, the movie The Hangover. You know, waking up the next day in the chaos. That was basically our party in our lives. But my friends who are still around, acquaintances, they don't find that entertaining anymore. You know what I mean? Like when we watch the movie The Hangover, we're like, holy shit, that's us. You know, like, <laughs> I used to always envision myself as being Phil. But I've come to the conclusion I'm not Phil, I'm Stu. I'm Stu, the J Dog was Phil, is Phil, and Pablo was uh, Alan. Well, Stu's the craziest out of the fucking bunch. Anyhow, I'm still in the mindset of the good old days, and all my friends have moved on and settled down. And I guess at 51 now, I'm a little late to this party, but it's time for me to move in a different direction. Okay, one more page here. And yeah, if it's noisy, listen. Philippines is a noisy country. The Filipinos are the noisiest chicks I've ever been around. And they know I'm sitting here talking to you with this camera. I say, hey, go about your normal stuff. But, you know, try not to cackle. They can't pull it off. There's nowhere I can go to get perfect audio. Not in the Philippines. So, we can talk about... Uh, let me talk about one more thing and then I'll close it out. I set an old goal, and the old goal 
was to climb Mount Everest. And I've got an article that I'm going to read verbatim that sort of ties in with this. A couple interesting things about running this channel. But like I set this goal to climb Mount Everest, and what it would do on a daily basis is push me harder. When I'm running, you know, if I'm running two miles, I'm like, go one more, I'm hit one more mile. Because if you're at the top of Everest for that last push to the summit, go one more mile. Extra preparation. Make sure you're prepared, right? And then every day what I would do, I, hey, did I, did I hit it enough today to condition myself to climb Mount Everest. Is there something I could have done or prepared or exercised more? And, and sort of the result at that time was a 44 year old stud. Really was. Now that goal sort of changed due to, it's just too much commercialism. The lines up to Everest look like Disneyland or Disney World or the freaking DMV. It's too commercialized now. There's no adventure in it. I need I need something new to push me because now when I think about Everest, I, I'm not motivated. But let me read you this article. What's it called? When travel becomes meaningless. When travel becomes meaningless. Now this is sort of historical about me running this channel here. So I wrote this in somewhere around 2018. I've been aimlessly roaming the world for years now with no real objective or long-term goal. I would describe my wanderings as a never-ending quest to figure out the mysteries of life. While I obviously love to travel, it has become routine and comfortable. Southeast Asia is home to me. The Middle East is too familiar. Guatemala feels like I'm sitting in front of a warm fireplace on a cool night. The only way for me to get the next high is to explore new places even further off the beaten path. I do less and less planning to internet, intentionally roll the dice and see what happens. This level of comfort has led me to boredom, has led to boredom. My, mo my motivation comes and goes at random. I'm craving the unknown. A man with no purpose is a dead man. I need a new adventure, something long-term, something to put me out of my comfort zone of being a lonely, introverted adventure traveler. World travel for me has become meaningless. This is my long-term plan, uh, should be plan. Got an extra E on there, it says plane. Damn, spelling champion here. This is my long-term plan I've come, come up with to get myself rejuvenated. I set a long-term goal. It came to me one night about a year ago I would work toward fulfilling another childhood dream that back in 1980 seemed impossible. I will climb Mount Everest before I die. I figure that's a realistic timeline to get the job done. There are a lot of obstacles in the way of me achieving this. Here are a few of the top problems to overcome. Number one, I'm not a mountain climber. Number two, I don't have 100,000 US dollars to pay for the trip. It's probably 150 to 200 grand now. I'm afraid of heights these days, and I hate the cold. Hundreds of climbers summit the mountain every year. It's not as spectacular a feat as it used to be when I was a kid. However, in my mind, it's still the same. Besides, I'm not doing this for my, I'm not doing this for anyone but myself. The goal of climbing Mount Everest gives me an excuse to spend some real time in Nepal. While Nepal is only a few countries over from where I'm sitting right now, I've never been there. Maybe you need to set a new, new goal along these lines to get the, the blood pumping. How this goal keeps me motivated. At night, I ask myself about what I did today to prepare for Mount Everest. I usually have an answer that's positive and relates to everyday life. The biggest and best thing I'm more concerned with now is physical fitness. I can't drag my old ass up Mount Everest unless I'm in good shape, that's obvious. My new focus is on cardio and endurance. Since I'm coming up on 46 years of age, those are exactly the subjects I should be addressing anyway. I currently spend a lot of my time in Thailand and do go to Muay Thai several times a week. That's a great workout, but my running has taken top priority. 
I usually do 5K when I hit the road, but I want to increase that to a daily 10K. I don't want to tire out when I'm 100 meters from the summit. Either way, the thought of climbing Everest keeps me motivated about my level of fitness while traveling. I'm now more inclined to walk greater distances with my backpack instead of taking a taxi or a bus. That saves money. I'm inclined to spend more time exploring and climbing the waterfalls and less time drinking in new bars. That's a good thing as well. Okay, I had to cut the video for a second because these ladies are disturbing me. Rebrand and rebrand. Establishing a new focus often means you have to do some rebranding. In my case, that included rebranding my online presence. I initially decided to rebrand my website and YouTube channel to something along the lines of mountain climbing. I call the channel Basecamp Journal. Why Basecamp Journal? First of all, when you travel and reach your destination, the first thing you do is set up some type of base camp. That might be a one-man tent at the base of a mountain or the penthouse suite at a five-star hotel. Once you establish a base camp, you can set out from there to climb, explore, or conduct international business. While the term often refers to mountaineering, that's not the only meaning. I thought it to be a fitting combination of words to chronicle my travels around the world and the goal of climbing Mount Everest. However, I realized the base camp journal sounded too much, sounded like too much of a niche for what I'm up to most of the time. I haven't made it to Nepal yet. I'm not doing anything substantially related to mountain climbing. It was confusing. I needed to rethink everything all over. I rebranded my YouTube channel to Overstay Road. The focus is on food, beer, visas. That accurately describes most of what I do. The first priority, priority of business was to set a second goal. I came to the conclusion that money is the only obstacle in my way of climbing Mount Everest. It's not the physical part at all. I need some real funds to dedicate to the cause to make this happen. So I had to set a new goal that would take first priority. My new objective is to generate $1 million per month in income by making travel videos. Currently, I'm up to $5 per month. Only 999995 $999, more to go. When I reach the target, I will head to Mount Everest and knock out that little challenge on the back end. Folks, one million bucks per month. It's not about the money, it's about the adventure of getting there. That's the excitement of it. I may never make it beyond five dollars per month. I don't really care. I'm enjoying the ride. If your current travels seem pointless, maybe it's time you rebrand yourself. If you're a scuba diver, it's okay to change up your expertise and go hike the Pacific Crest Trail. I'm sure you had a great time all those years scuba diving, but for me, at some point, it's time for a new chapter. Life is short, and you only get one ride. Rebrand yourself as many times as you can. I've simplified my social media. I've made the decision to focus on two media plat platforms from now on this website and my YouTube channel. While I may occasionally post a link or two on other social media sites, I won't be interacting. There's just not enough time. By simplifying social media, it will give me more time to actually enjoy my travels and make authentic video instead of thinking about posting the perfect, useless Instagram photo and caption. I ditched Facebook years ago, so that's not an issue. I recommend you do the same. Facebook robs you of more time than any other element of your life. Get rid of it. I may have one of my girlfriends post some links on there, but that's it. Facebook is a horrible creature. I think the average traveler these days has one thing on his or her mind, and that's posting a trophy shot on Facebook. Hey, that's fine if it makes you happy. The worst thing is that it, makes, it takes 10 seconds to snap a selfie, but then hours of staring at the phone replying to comments. Just go to Angkor Wat and Siem Reap, Cambodia and observe people's behavior. They spend 1% of their time looking at the temple and 99% of their time staring at their cell phone. What a waste. 
If I weren't making money online, I would ditch every social media platform and be done with it. The only thing I would keep is YouTube so I can watch documentaries at night. Travel is meant to be about the moment. Unless you're running a blog with some useful info, no one really cares about your travels. Trust me on that one. Your Facebook friends don't give a damn that you're drinking rum runners at the beach. If I weren't in the online game, I wouldn't even carry a camera with me anymore. I would leave my cell phone in my room and just enjoy being an explorer. Simplify and prune the social media platforms you interact with. This will provide more time to actually enjoy yourself while traveling. A new outlook. Instead of getting drunk every night in the shadiest bars I can find, I'm now more interested in cooking, barbecuing, hiking, trekking, long distance backpacking. I'm not saying that I won't get drunk every now and then and act crazy. It's in my nature to do stupid shit. What I am saying is that the new chapter has already begun. I'm on the long road to the summit of Mount Everest by way of making a million dollars per month with my travel show. Once I climb Mount Everest, it will be time for the next adventure, whatever that may be. With a million dollars per month income, I'll be able to expand my creativity. Thanks for reading and browsing my random thoughts. Drop me a line and let me know what keeps you motivated and focused when your job, travel, or life in general seems meaningless. Do you set new goals? Or do you just embrace the grind and accept the cards you've been dealt? That's the article there. I'll put links to these articles down in the description if you're interested. But when I wrote this article in 2018, that was my mindset. Now have I adhered or accomplished everything I just talked about? Well, obviously not. But it did push me in a direction where I'm at where I am today. Where at that point right there, it was just all about going to the bars every night. It was just still about go, go to this city, drop the backpack in the room, and then find the bar, find the girls. And a lot of you join me during that time frame where a lot of what I'm doing is sitting in bars, talking about girls, drinking beer, just talking to my iPhone or live streaming, whatever. And I appreciate, appreciate y'all joining me during that, that time frame. Since then, where's the wind blown me? Blew me? Blew. Either way you say it, it don't sound good. Where has the wind taken me? It's taken me to two beautiful children, spending time in my Filipino wife's village, having family day. And again, like I said in the article, I'm still crazy. I still go out every now and then and do stupid things. But that's gonna come to an end because I won't be drinking anymore. And when I'm sober, the stupid things I do are much more calculated. Anyhow, I just thought I'd share that article with you. You know, again, it's, it's years old. Obviously, I'm not making a million dollars a month. But I think uh, a good point of the article is it's never too late to rebrand yourself. You know, if, you, if you're working a, an industry or a job that you're not happy in, what's wrong with rebranding yourself? What's wrong with getting a new job? My job up until I left the U.S. was somehow associated with the government slash law enforcement. And I said, I don't want to do that anymore. When I want to move to Thailand and I want to do something totally different. I have no idea what I'm, I'm going to try to write books. Well, I already wrote, a, uh, already wrote one book at that point, but I said, I'm going to try to be an author. Now, let me tell you, it's very hard to make a living off of writing books. Very few people make any money off a book. It's very easy to write a book, damn near impossible to sell a book. So what I did, I pivoted to other things. Why? Not because it was easy, but because it was hard, because it is hard. 
that JFK speech about going to the moon, right? Which I'm, I still don't believe we went to the moon, but it was a great speech. We choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, because it's hard. You know, a lot of billionaires, what they secretly wish for, this is what they say, I'm not a billionaire. Billionaires secretly wish that they would lose their entire fortune just to see and go through the excitement of trying to build it back. Because the excitement of becoming a billionaire is the journey getting there. And once you get there, it just becomes same old grind, but at a different level. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I've read articles that say that's what, what, what do billionaires really want? They want to fucking lose everything and have to start over because it's a challenge. Anyhow, so in closing, this video, it's, it's not an apology letter. This video ain't for nobody but me, but I share the thoughts with you to try to invoke thought and maybe help you in your life or maybe not. Maybe just you listen for the entertainment value. Um, I don't know why I made this note. I was thinking about Anthony Bourdain when I was laying in that hotel room. I guess it's because I was wearing a robe. You know, the minute I checked in, I dropped my clothes, hit the bathtub for an hour, shower, I'm drinking down bottles of water, end up with just staying in my robe for 24 hours. And every time I put a bathrobe or yeah, a robe on, bathrobe in a hotel, I think about Anthony Bourdain. Whole world loved the guy, still loves the guy. But where did he come from? You know, he started out as a heroin junkie who eventually got a book to, to take off and the rest is history. World famous guy, right up until he hung himself with his bathrobe, left a child behind. That was the asshole move in it. I already talked about, about the story of my life has been an episode or one of the hangover movies i've already talked about rejecting the branding of being an alcoholic that's just one i, I don't i don't subscribe to that and reinvent yourself as many times as you can before you die because we all have less than 100. all right that's the end of my notes that's where i'm at in life folks How many of y'all right now are leaving comments or writing and say, I bet, I bet the fool don't make it one week. I bet, I bet he don't make it a month. Well, it's up to you. You know, never say never. Because what would happen, we talk about rebranding. What would happen if say some whiskey company came along right now and said, hey, we want you to be our spokesperson. Or Heineken came to me and said, you know what, dude, you're the new most interesting man in the world because you are. I'd probably go back to drinking some Heineken. Not too much, but I would probably be the new, the new spokesperson, the new most interesting man in the world doing Heineken commercials. How could I not? What if Jack Daniels came to me and said, hey, man, you know, we want you to be the spokesperson for Jack Daniels in Southeast Asia. I'd probably be sipping on some whiskey. Sipping. You get my flow? So, I'm putting this out there in a philosophical way, but in the same sense, I'm a realist. So there you go. But I don't see myself going back to drinking unless there's some type of sponsorship or monetary uh, incentive on a big level for me to do so. There you go. If Bud Light came to me and said, man, we want you to fix our brand image problem and get us back to where we were before this uh, debacle. <laughs> trying to keep this where I don't get anything on this video, uh, limited ads or no. We want you to fix our brand image. Sure, I would help Bud Light out. 
Why? Because Bud Light was a big part of my life right up until I left America. I owe them a lot. Used to be one of the best beers until they started tweaking the recipe and screwed it all up. Ain't got nothing to do with the branding debacle. They changed the recipe. It's not a, it don't taste like it used to. But if they came to me and said, hey man, you're the redneck we need to fix our brand image, I'd say, okay, one condition. You take the recipe back to it was at least in 1993. Go back to that recipe. I'll help you fix the brand image. That's what they need. They need a redneck that's originally from Mississippi to fix their brand image. So would I go back to drinking? I'd be drinking Bud Light if they change the recipe and give me some money. Can it be bought? Not really, but maybe. I can be bought on my own terms. That's why I don't have any sponsors. I'm not a sponsorable dude, because I have conditions. Number one, don't tell me what to say. <laughs> that right there, nobody wants to sponsor me. <laughs> don't tell me what I don't tell me what I can't say. Oh, you can't do this, or you can't be seen, you know, drinking this brand. Don't tell me that, don't tell me that. Not interested. Go away. Folks, thanks for joining me. One more thing about the old lady. Let me try to get her to come over here. Baby girl, Fatima. Baby girl. Earth to Fatima. Over here, baby. Her brain was on Bisaya. She wasn't listening for English. It was just like she had the earphones on. Come see her, baby. Come here. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna ask you a question. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. All right. This old big girl. Are you in frame? All right, baby. Listen. Are you? Are you? Are you excited? Are you happy about me stopping drinking? What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm happy. What What happened when I? What happened when I first told you that I was quitting? I'm shot. I, I cannot believe. No, you were laughing. <laughs> yeah, same. I cannot believe. I'm laughing. Because for seven years, I never... You, you keep telling me I'm quitting drinking, but... At two weeks, I cannot... I'm not think, I cannot think. If I don't have drink beer, I'm not drinking beer. Okay. That's why... When you put your hair up, I think about drinking. If you leave your hair down, I don't no, think about drinking. No, it's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hot. It is hot. It's hot in the Philippines right now, folks. It's so hot that a lot of the schools have suspended school during this heat wave or they're cutting their hours back. Uh, all right, baby. Anyway, th thanks for your cameo appearance, baby. Anything else you want to say? What I heard that you're going to drink a uh, honeycomb or what? Uh, that's only if they give me a brand sponsorship and give us a bunch of money. Then I got to drink some beer for the commercial. Okay, babe. Thanks. Thanks for your cameo appearance. All right, folks. Leave your comments. Leave. Uh, I want to hear the comments. Good, bad, ugly. The naysayers. The disbelievers. But I do hope that at least something in this video both thought. And if you're that person that's struggling with any type of addiction, admitting that you got a problem is the first step in getting help. How you go about it, that's up to you. But nobody's going to tell you to change and you change. Everything comes from within. Everybody can harp on you and harp on you and complain and do these interventions and shit. No, nothing works until you decide for yourself that you're going to do something different. That's what I've learned throughout the years dealing with addiction in my profession, whether it be the medical field or law enforcement. Nobody's going to change, especially a grown man. A grown man's not going to take advice, and he's not going to change until he wants to change. So there you go. You know, I'm a pirate who passed 50. I'm 51 right now. I'm tired of drinking. It's, it's boring. Unless I'm the new inter most interesting man in the world. <laughs> Alright, I'm out of here. Peace out, my friends. I'll see you guys on the next one. It's time to go to the beach. Okay, hey, one more thing. I know some of y'all probably been hitting me through the video saying why. Why you got yellow nails. Well, I got yellow, pink, maybe a little purple there. It's because of this girl right here. 
got a gift from Uncle Jay. And she got some new. What you got, sweetie? You have uh, nail polish and lip balm. And uh, what do you call these fake nails? Glue on nails. Hey, buddy. Anyhow, folks. You know, throughout the years, you see me with either makeup on or stuff on my nails. It's due to this this girl right here, cause she loves to do makeup, right? One day you wanna you wanna own a salon, you wanna yes, open sir. a salon. I want many makeups. You want lots of makeup? Like Auntie Mel Jean. Yeah, Auntie Mel Jean's got a lot of makeup, right? Last night she went in there and came in there with Mel Jean's makeup bag. Wanted to do my makeup at like eight o'clock at night, but it's real makeup. And what Papa discovered is that it takes a lot of scrubbing to get real makeup off. But it doesn't take a lot of work to take off the play makeup. So, anyhow, if you wonder why I got yellow nails. And see, she's just peeling it off. So she, the, the play stuff just peels off. And she paints my nails like three, four times Forest. a day. Hey, buddy. Peace out, my friends. Love each and every one of you.